Okay, um, good evening everyone. It's really nice to see so many people here. I won't flatter myself because they're here to see me, they're here to see, they're here to see the judge. But I'm really, really nice to see so many people here. Um, I was going to say about three words and then I arrived this evening and Steve Harris was here. And Steve usually has a kind of 35 minute speech giving a detailed history of, of William Marsden's biography right from the point he was born in Deptford in 1742 uh, to his eventual demise. And I'm really disappointed I won't be able to share that with you today. But I will, I will set a little bit of context before you hear from Derek Spookery come coming before. We were founded as a hospital in 1828. 1828 is nearly 200 years ago, and the world has changed quite a lot um, since then. And the Duke of Wellington was the Prime Minister uh, when we were founded. Um, I think probably a slight improvement on the current state of things. We went straight, we went straight into that. Um, but what, what I really want to do is say that healthcare um, worldwide, um, not unique here, but healthcare worldwide is facing a, a massive um, problem at the moment. We've got a population that is getting older, and part of that is due to the success of modern medicine and modern public health measures. Um, in addition, um, that growing elderly population um, has an increase, is, you know, has increased, I don't like using the word burden, but has an increased burden of long term conditions, so they're becoming more complex. And at the same time, um, medical infl inflation, so the, treat the new treatments we develop, and the kit. Um, the kits that we develop um, gets more expensive at a higher rate than conventional, than conventional inflation. So we've got an increased demand on our health services and actually reduced resource to deal with that. There's a real temptation um, to try and deal with that by just doing what we've always done a bit harder. And, and it, it absolutely unequivocally um, isn't the answer. I came here two and a half years ago, so I still feel like a real new boy. I came here two and a half years ago, and one of the reasons I came here was because of the vision that various people, um, David Sloan and Dominic, and others in the room, um, told me about. About really trying to kind of move the needle about doing things differently. About a real focus on improvement and quality, and a real focus in taking out unwarranted variation in the care of the and I think we've made some real steps in that. We've had the privilege of having Derek here for two days um, with colleagues, giving us an update on the progress we're making. So I think we've made a real important step on that journey, but there's more to go. And the way we're going to go further down that, I think is, I think is going to be through partnerships. Um, we've got a long-standing partnership with Cord Wainers. Uh, William Marsden was a Cord Wainer, and uh, you'll hear more from the um, we've got a lot of fantastically important partnerships locally with other providers, um, with our charity who are very generously contributing to the project tonight. Um, the, the final partnership I'll talk about is our, our partnership with the IHI. The IHI are the, the preeminent organisation in the rating of quality in the delivery of healthcare worldwide. And so that's a fantastic privilege to have their president and chief executive talk to us. And let's hear from him rather than me. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's, uh... So I, I want to ask, the, ask this question. In the light of all of those things that Chris uh, talked about in his introduction, um, the, the ageing of the population, the growth in the, uh, in the prevalence of chronic disease, the complexity uh, of all of that, the fact that uh, healthcare is, uh, uh, consumes a significant amount of our um, gross domestic product, the fact that our workforce is ageing in uh, healthcare, particularly our nursing workforce, the, the fact that the demands on healthcare are changing in this world of globalisation and 
consumerisation. And I think uh, people have a set of entirely realistic and um, important expectations that we need to respond to. And the, uh, the relatively late introduction of technology to the healthcare scene. Healthcare has been uh, a late adopter of technology and not every techno technological implementation has proven to be uh, advantageous. We often struggle with that. Uh, and uh, in the light of all of that, I'm asking this question about is it time for radical redesign? Uh, and I don't know, if, if anybody was expecting uh, someone uh, get to give this lecture who would have all of the answers, um, then it, it's not me. Um, but I, I do know that the answer to those kind of challenges, the, the way that the uh, forward-thinking, uh, world-leading organisations like Royal Free should respond to those challenges is not just by doing more of the same. It's not just about running faster. Um, and I want to illustrate the, this point by introducing you to the world's first seven-masted schooner, the Thomas W. Lawson. Can anybody guess what the Thomas W. Lawson was the response to? Steam. The Thomas W. Lawson was the, was the response to the coming of the steamship. Uh, and so the answer that the builders of the Thomas W. Lawson had was, let's add more sail. More of the same. Turns out that a seven-masted schooner is inherently unstable. <laughs> and tragically, the Thomas W. Lawson went down, ironically, off the Isles of Scilly. <laughs> um, with loss of life, tragically. But the answer to the coming of steam was not more of the same. Uh, the answer was radical redesign, and I think it's the same for us in, uh, in healthcare. And you'll hear a lot of talk all over the world about this thing called transformation. It's the new buzzword in healthcare. Those of you who don't interact with it every day may, maybe are missing this, but those of us who have come to work every day in healthcare will hear pe lots of people talk about transformation. Frankly, if you hear people talk about tra transformation, uh, be curious with them, because most of them have no idea what they're talking about. And most of them just mean change, uh, but what we need in healthcare is genuine transformation. It's all of the things on the, uh, the left-hand side of that slide. It's about uh, a, a, a plan to deal with a future state. It's about a, a, a way to be proactive rather than just, just to respond. It's a way to engage our people. Uh, in the process of transformation, and crucially it involves this thing called a paradigm shift. So let me just explain what a paradigm shift is, and he here again I have another introduction to make. Does anybody happen to know who this gentleman is? Gutenberg. G Gutenberg. You are the first person, I've shown this slide all over the world, <laughs> you are the first person who's ever known that this is beyond being obviously the winner of the uh, most luxurious beard of 1450 <laughs> prize, this is Johannes Gutenberg, uh, the, and, and the inventor of the printing press. <coughs> and it was a, that's a paradigm shift, uh, because previous to Gutenberg there was no efficient way to produce mass media. Um, we were relying on people laboriously copying um, uh, papers or laboriously setting type and, and Gutenberg invented the printing press which had uh, a new way to think about traditional issues, a, a, a new set of processes which he created including having movable type. Um, some new, new ideas, some of which he frankly stole. Uh, so the the, print, the printing presses of Gutenberg's time looked remarkably like uh, wine presses, grape presses from winemaking. That's because he stole the idea from there. And we in healthcare some, somehow seem to be a bit reticent about stealing ideas from other industries. And we should be less so, I think. And a new set of, meth of methods. So I think what we need in order to tackle those kind of issues that Chris alluded to is just is a new paradigm a new way to think about um, old problems. 
So what might that look like? Uh, what might our new paradigm consist of? So this was a question that um, myself and my colleague Don Berwick, who was the founder of IHI, asked a group of healthcare organisations that we work with in the United States. It's, uh, 40 plus, now actually near 50 organisations who we said, what, what are the answers to, the, to those kind of future challenges look like and, and what should we do? We took our inspiration, inspiration from a report that was called Crossing the Quality Chasm, which had been published 20 years previously and had a set of, um, of design principles embedded in it. But when we looked at those, they were very hospital-centric. They weren't really <coughs> equipped to deal with the challenges that Chris mentioned or that I outlined in my first slide. And so we tried to update those, and we came up with these 10 radical redesign principles. If we're going to transform healthcare to meet the challenges of the future, what, where will be our guides? What, what will be the things that we ought to think about? The first of our radical redesign principles is this one about change the balance of power. So I must stand in your way. Can you not see this? You okay? Change the balance of power. So let's think about how we can co-produce uh, health and well-being in partnership with patients and families in our communities so that healthcare can respond to some of that consumerism and globalisation that uh, we talked about. Second, and Chris alluded to this as well, let's standardise what makes sense. That's what the, uh, the work you've been doing here in clinical practice groups is designed to get you. Um, let's standardise all the stuff that we can standardise so that there's no unnecessary variation. There should only be variation when it's customised to the individual, uh, when, it, when it's a response to uh, individual needs. And we need to do both of those things. Let's promote well-being. We spent uh, uh, 90 minutes this afternoon with a group of people inside the Royal Free who are thinking about joy in work, uh, which is the f fifth of those um, radical redesign principles. And those, those are connected because we're trying to create joy in work so that we can promote well-being in our staff. We're much more likely to promote well-being in our communities if our staff feel healthy and engaged and resilient. The sixth one's about making it easy. So how do we re re reduce all of the waste and non-value added stuff that we ask our uh, clinical teams and others to do? Um, there have been a number of studies both in the United States and over here that shows that something in the region of 30% of what healthcare does has no value for patients. Can we, can we get some of that out uh, so that we can focus our energies elsewhere? Move knowledge, not people. We've got ourselves stuck in this way of delivering healthcare which usually involves people coming to us. Um, and is there a way rather of moving people around our system that we can move the knowledge efficiently? This notion that we can collaborate and cooperate with uh, partners beyond healthcare's walls seemed to us to be a really important thing to think about as we try and achieve what we call the triple aim, care better than we've ever seen, health better than we've ever known at a cost we can all afford. Assume abundance, so uh, optimise all of the assets that are available to us. Uh, and finally, and somewhat controversially, return the money. If there's 30% of waste in our systems, we shouldn't keep all of the proceeds. We should be using that to uh, e e equip people to stay healthy rather than treat them when they're sick. So those are our 10 radical redesign principles. And what I just wanted to do with the rest of my time is just try and uh, illustrate what we really mean by those. And, uh, and uh, you can then help me figure out whether these are the kind of signposts along the way to that radical redesign. So I got to spend, some, I get to spend a lot of my time on the road uh, all over the world. And I came across this uh, healthcare system called South Central Foundation who operate out of Anchorage, Alaska. They uh, serve the, uh, the native Alaskan population. Um, and they have completely transformed, and in in, in absolutely in the meaning of the word I described, the way in which they deliver care. They do not refer, for example, to their patients as patients. They refer to them as customer owners. 
Um, their fundamental belief is that the people they serve own the system. Uh, and the system exists to serve those people. And so they have uh, gradually over time transferred power over decision making uh, for a, a s certain set of things to the customer owners. Um, and uh, the system takes many less decisions about what's right for the patient. And the patient takes many more. The customer owner takes many more decisions about what's right for them. And of course there's a place where those two things meet uh, and decisions are taken uh, jointly and it's always a conversation between the provider and the patient. Um, but that way of doing things, that recognition that um, power is not distributed in our systems in a way that levels the playing ground, the playing field for our uh, patients, families or customer owners has led to those kind of results. Um, many fewer people having to attend um, in the emergency room, the emergency department as we would call it, a 36% in reduction in hospital discharges um, because people are not coming into hospital in the first place and huge levels of customer satisfaction. Patient satisfaction levels of 97% are not common in a, in a healthcare system and they have achieved that by shifting the balance of power, by trying to, to engage patients in everyday decisions about what's right for them. There's a big gap currently be between what we know, what's evidence-based clinical practice and what we do. <coughs> And this idea of standardizing what makes sense is really about closing that gap. How do we close the gap between what we know and what we do? Uh, that's, that's the work that, um, the important work that the CPGs and others are doing here. Uh, one of the areas in which we at IHI have been trying to do this is in the, in the area of what we call age-friendly care, age-friendly health care. Um, recognizing that growth in the adult population and accepting that many, many of the patients that we, that we serve are, uh, are older people. When we looked at what we knew, we found 90 plus possible care interventions, 90 care features that had been identified in various evidence-based models. It was no wonder that people were struggling with the gap between what we know and what we do because no one was doing any sense making for them between the 90 things that they could possibly do that were all evidence based and what they, what they should actually do. So we got uh, as many of the, the, the originators of that evidence as we could and some healthcare systems in the same room at the same time and we said can you make this evidence implementable? Uh, and we, our guide to them was, can you make it no more than five things? The, the provider said, if you tell us f five things we ought to do reliably, there's a good chance we'll do them. And eventually we got it down to four. Uh, four uh, M's, as we call them. Those are the four M's. Asking every patient what matters to them. Um, paying attention to medication. Uh, actively trying to identify, prevent and treat uh, mentation issues including dementia and getting people mobile. Uh, and we have now got um, hundreds of healthcare systems in the US implementing that uh, in a way that they never could with the 90 care features. Beginning gradually to close the gap uh, between uh, what we know and what we do. Uh, what they're doing is still evidence-based. It's still the kind of thing that we train our clinical teams to do. It's just implementable now. Uh, so let's try and continue that closing of the no-do gap. The third principle is really about customising to the individual. Uh, and uh, this is a picture on the left-hand side of our uh, IHI National Forum that we get. We have this every December in Orlando. Um, if you're going to have a meeting in December, it's a good idea to have it in Orlando. 
people like the sun. <laughs> uh, we had it once in Chicago, almost no one came. <laughs> <laughs> But normally 6,000 people come to this and they listen to presentations about um, how we think care can be improved. Experiences from other uh, folks. And um, this nurse, who's uh, um, at the time was a staff nurse in a children's hospital in Glasgow, uh, was in the audience. Her name's Jen Rogers. And Jen heard my colleague Maureen, Maureen Bizignano talk about... Um, uh, report that had just been published in the, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine about the power of asking a simple question. And the question is, what matters to you? And the authors of the journal article were trying to encourage people not just to ask the patient, what's the matter? Uh, and be, pay attention to their clinical uh, condition and symptoms, but also ask, what matters to you? What's really important to you? What would you like to do? How would you like to be able to live your life differently and better? And Jen was there and she said, she said I want to take that back to me, with me. And she took it back to her children's hospital in Glasgow and she began to uh, ask her patients what matters to them. One of the patients was this uh, young girl called Kendra. This is, I actually have this original uh, poster now in the office because this is how... Uh, Jen started to translate what she'd heard about customising to the individual to her patients. She just gave them a sheet of paper and some coloured pens and she asked them to, to draw what matters to them. Uh, and Kendra has uh, autism and struggled a little bit to do this herself, but her dad helped her to create this What Matters to Me um, poster. You can see some of the things in it. Um, I don't know if I've got the animation here or not. Yeah. Uh, I don't like medication by my mouth, so watch out, I will struggle. It's a three-person job, <laughs> says Kendra. I'm very fast, I'll put things in my mouth. I can make a run for it. Ha, ha, ha. I love cuddles, to reassure me. The, the Kendra's father was uh, admitted to the adult hospital. He... Um, felt unwell, there was uh, signs of uh, a cardiac um, a, a attack, uh, and so he was uh, taken off to the adult hospital. Kendra, a seven-year-old girl with autism, is left in the ward alone. Uh, and what guided the staff through how best to care for Kendra during that period was this. Um, they knew that she liked cuddles to reassure her. They also knew that her way of saying hello was to pull your hair. It, it, it wasn't Kendra being violent and aggressive. Um, it, it was her way of saying hello. Um, she can dress herself with some help. She can do high fives. She likes noisy toys. I've skipped again. Uh, and so that whole kind of um, what, what matters to you relatively simple thing to do has become a global phenomenon. Jen started to, she talked to her friend in the adult hospital and they introduced it first for the geriatric uh, uh, patients but then for everybody in the hospital. The new Glasgow hospital, the biggest publicly funded hospital in, in Europe, has a what matters to you board in every single room. Uh, and every single patient is given the opportunity to fill in. They can choose whether they want to or not, most do. Um, and from there, it began, to, it went global. People started to hear about it, and uh, a whole host of countries now celebrate on the 6th of June what matters to you day, uh, including people here at Royal Free uh, who uh, are part of this uh, social movement that has been created around uh, customising care to the needs of the individual. I, I love this, uh, and if you do want to stand up and stretch, this would be a good time to do it. Um, but there is a real need, I think, for us to think about promoting uh, well-being, uh, including th that of our own staff. Um, I, this is another story from uh, Scotland, it's just where I'm from. If I get a chance to tell a story from Scotland, I'll tell a story from Scotland. 
this is a, a, this, a story of Elaine Wiley, who is a primary school teacher. That, incidentally, is not the primary school. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Stirling Castle. The primary school is a, a wee bit more modest. Uh, Elaine begins to notice the uh, increasing levels of obesity in our classrooms. Um, and uh, she's got a, a, a group of patients who are spread across the various social uh, poverty deciles of, of Scotland. She's, she's got a kind of representative sample of uh, S Scottish pupils with a, perhaps a little bit of a, a, a kind of bias towards uh, relatively poor uh, students. And so at the start, 45% of the pupils were overweight. Elaine's uh, solution to this is relatively simple. She introduces this thing called the Daily Mile. Uh, where she gets ev every patient, every patient, every child in the school to run a mile every day, uh, and they uh, they used improvement science to figure out how to get from no children running a mile every day to every child running a mile every day. And so at first they got the children to change out into their gym clothes, but that took far too long. Uh, and allowed an, a number of them who uh, would change very slowly <laughs> to miss running a mile. And so eventually they just said to the, school, to the class teachers, get them to do it whenever they like. Um, get them to do it together if you can. The teachers actually run with them quite often and they, the pupils will tell them things that they wouldn't tell them in the class. Um, and at the end of the three-year three, three year period, um, not one child overweight in primary one. So they had introduced this to the nursery school. By the time they get into primary one, uh, none of the children overweight. Some of the children who were in primary seven at the time have gone on to be uh, active youth runners. They've got a whole bunch of them now who are in age group champions for the whole country. Just through a simple intervention of getting people to run a mile every day. Um, so, uh, the, uh, an example of how we, what we mean when we talk about um, promoting well-being. Remember, our fifth for those of you who, are, who have been p counting is about joy and work, and uh, this is something that the uh, people here at Royal Free are taking very seriously, uh, and they're working really hard to um, to create joy and work. And that maybe sounds to some of you like a kind of frivolous thing to do. Why should our healthcare workers be joyful? But the reason why they're doing it is because there's an incredibly strong evidence base that um, more engaged uh, and less stressed staff leads to better care for patients. In a big study done by the Gallup organization, a massive global survey, they looked at levels of staff engagement, and that's what people are trying to build here with this work on joy. They looked at levels of staff engagement uh, in multiple organizations, hundreds of healthcare organizations across the world. In organizations in the top quartile of staff engagement, compared to organizations in the bottom quartile, there were 58% fewer patient safety incidents. 58% less harm to patients because those organizations invested in their staff. Because those organizations wanted a staff who were joyful and felt a sense of meaning and purpose rather than burned out and stressed. The folks here at Royal Free have been using this basic model. Note the importance of that, what matters to you question again, that it's just as important that we ask that to our staff as we do to our patients. Uh, and then Let's figure out what's getting in the way of people having joy. Let's make it a shared responsibility. And then let's use the, those small tests of change like Elaine Wiley used with the Royal Mile pupils to figure out, well, okay, so what can we do? And I won't uh, spend any time on this, but this is just the kind of reservoir of things that people can do in order to create joy. All right, we're at six now, which is, remember that one that's about make it easy, which is about let's stop doing all of that wasteful stuff that we do. 
uh, in a couple of years now, uh, and this is coming back next year royal free, so get ready for it. Uh, we did this thing called breaking the rules, uh, which again was a slightly kind of edgy thing for, for us to do. Again, many of you who are patients in the room might say, well, I actually don't want my uh, healthcare provider to break the rules. But what we said was break the rules that get in the way of good patient care. Um, so if you see something that's stopping you providing the best possible care for patients, break that rule. Stop doing that. Do something else instead. We had 24 participating organisations in Europe and they identified 375 rules uh, that could be broken um, because they were getting in the way. Not big, and most of them, it turned out, were not... Uh, we, people said, oh, that's the, the, that'll be, it'll be uh, the law or regulations <laughs> or even proper clinical standards. And it was none of those things. Mostly it was just habit and myth. Um, and so we, we surfaced a whole bunch of rules in the organi organization and we encouraged people to, uh, to break them because that way we could take out some of the nonsense that we had just, that had just accrued and accreted over time. Um, seven is move knowledge, not people. And I want to tell you a story this time from uh, Africa about a very simple intervention, which is to put a retinal scanner on a mobile phone. Um, uh, and this has been done to great effect in uh, Kenya. There a whole uh, tra tragically high number of Kenyan youngsters who uh, quite avoidably suffer blindness because no one is doing the simple routine checks that um, would lead to treatment and prevention of that. So they taught teachers how to use these retinal scanners. They attached them to their mobile phones. They took the scan uh, and they sent them off to be uh, um, examined. Turns out the, the quality of the scans are often better with the mobile phone technology than if the child had gone into an African hospital. Um, so not just a way of moving knowledge and getting 10,000 children screened who would not otherwise be screened, uh, but also an enhancement to the quality of the screening. This is Project Echo, and the gentleman in the red tie there is, uh, 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 his name is Sanjeev Arora. Uh, and San Sanjeev runs this thing called Project Echo, which he calls democratising knowledge. So what he's doing in Project ECHO is he's getting the leading experts in uh, particular uh, conditions and specialties in a room at the same time. You can see them there. In the, this is the, uh, in the University of New Mexico. Um, uh, and they're, they're uh, linking up with practitioners from, uh, in this case, the rest of the state, but now actually the rest of the world, to, to do um, live consultations. So often it will be just clinician to clinician, but sometimes in, the, uh, in those small primary care units, a patient will be seen and they can get access to the best kind of, uh, the best uh, specialists without, without having to leave their home again. So it's a kind of reinforcement of the move knowledge, not people thing. Um, but in a collaborative environment where people are willing to share their expertise and make it freely available and as Sanjeev says democratise knowledge. Nine is about assuming abundance uh, and, and my illustration of that is, uh, is, is from uh, Jersey. So we did a, uh, an innovation exercise a few years ago where we looked for innovations in Europe that might be imported to the United States. And we found this one. Uh, and so this is uh, the post office checking on uh, frail elderly people. So in addition to delivering the mail, they, they just knock on the door and say, you doing okay, Mrs. Jones? Um, everything all right today? 
Anything I can get for you? Has anybody been in to see you? And so they've got a little script that they run through, um, but that's using an asset that was never previously conceived of as being a healthcare asset to try and create well-being in those communities. Um, when we tried to import this to the US, the US Postal Service didn't really want to do it. <laughs> Not because they uh, were um, unwilling, really, or, or, or even for financial reasons, but they were scared of being sued yeah. uh, um, if they missed anything. Uh, so we just, we just hired uh, lay workers to follow the post van around. <laughs> Uh, and so the postie delivers the post and then someone knocks at the door right after them and says, you, you just got your parcel, just wanted to make sure you got it okay. Um, and then ask the questions. So thinking about assets uh, differently and you can see some of the fantastic feedback that they got from the customers in Jersey. Uh, and the first American city we tried to do this was Detroit and the feedback from Detroit now is the same. And I think a great example of what we mean by return the money is, uh, is this story, from, uh, which is from Wisconsin in the United States. One of our uh, partners in the US, uh, uh, that our friends here at Royal Free get to interact with, uh, is Bell & Health. They're based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. For those of you who follow uh, the American football, it's the home of the Green Bay Packers. <coughs> uh, the biggest thing in the town is the Green Bay Packers Stadium. Uh, and Bell and Health are the proud healthcare providers to the Packers, but they also entered into this highly unusual arrangement with their community, where they challenged the uh, employers in the community who pay most of for, pay for most of healthcare uh, to get their s staff well. So they did wellness assessments, uh, and there were, and the the more progress that the staff made on their wellness assessments, the less Bellin asked the employer to pay, and the difference between the two, Bellin invested in the community. So that community centre was built on the basis of the people of Green Bay, Wisconsin getting healthier, and the Bellin health system returning the savings that they got because they were serving a healthier population to the community. They also equipped, uh, they used some of the money also to train students in Algoma, Wisconsin, in, uh, in quality improvement. Uh, and so there's a, now 50 or so high school students in Algoma, Wisconsin, who are quality improvement experts. Uh, and they're, they're using their quality improvement skills to do a whole host of things for their community. They've been, uh, they've been getting uh, fresh fruit to the uh, to the school, they've been uh, they, they um, run their own clothing bank. They've been training the community in hands-only CPR, all using their quality improvement skills. Again, on the back of that funding from Bell and Health, uh, and so the, the, there's a there's a win-win I think in this return the money that as you think further about how to make good on this, I think hi highly. Um, laudable challenge that you've set yourselves, which is not just to serve the patients that come in your door, but to say, serve the 1.2 million, is it, people who live in your catchment area, um, there are some opportunities to think about, to think about how do we uh, encourage that investment. So those of you who uh, have stayed awake, uh, thank you. Uh, and this is the one slide that you really just needed. The rest of it was all just filling, filling really. But these, I think, are the kind of radical redesign principles that might help us to meet some of those challenges. That, that, this, I think, is the, the way to work differently um, that we're beginning to see um, the, the value in, that changing the balance of power so that the, the patient's voice is heard more clearly like it is in, in Alaska. Oops. The, you are already at Royal Free, leading the way on this closing of the no-do gap, figuring out how to take some of the variation out of healthcare. Uh, the importance of that question about what matters to you and remembering the, the, the power of that for, 
for families like Kendra's family. The importance of pr promoting well-being. I expect the Daily Mail to be a regular part of your uh, approach, Dominic. You can maybe introduce it at board meetings. It, it could work. Um, the importance of joy in work, the, uh, not just for the staff, although that's vitally important of its own, but for the patients too, because we know that highly engaged staff deliver better care. The, uh, the, how vital it is to try and take some of the waste out of our system, the wasted energy and the wasted resources. Um, can we rethink how we engage with people so that we're moving the knowledge around rather than forcing the people always to come to us. Uh, the importance of doing this in a way that's collaborative and cooperative and also utilises all of the assets that are available to us. And then let's think about how we use the considerable investment that taxpayers make in our NHS. All of that needs a vanguard. It needs a group of people who are willing to take this on and think differently about it and uh, that's why for us at IHI it's a real pleasure to work here uh, because there's a receptivity to new ideas, a willingness to consider new ways to think about old problems uh, and uh, increasingly a, 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 a means to secure improvement that really is at the very forefront of uh, of thinking in healthcare, and I uh, commend you. It's, it's one of the reasons why I love to come here uh, as often as I do. And those of you who are thinking about, well, what's in that for me? You know, he, he's talked a lot about a lot of big things there. So again, just bear in mind that most of these things started with one person. No William Marsden, no Royal Free. And as I read about William Marsden in preparation for this, I'm fairly sure that he would have been in favour of radical redesign. So people, everybody commented, for example, one of the things that, that when you read what people said about him, one of the things that comes out again and again is boldness. Marsden was bold. He was willing to contemplate things that no one else was willing to contemplate. He was ahead of his time. And he's, he set up uh, a, a, an organisation, and I, I quote, where poverty and sickness are the only passports. In, in, in some ways, you know, no Marsden, Roy, 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 you might just want to say no Marsden, no NHS. The idea that care should be freely available to people on the basis, of, not of their ability to pay, but on the basis of need, was as radical as it ever got in the days when he said it. No Gutenberg, no mass media. We'd still all be writing stuff out longhand. And you know how that is, That's, you know how problematic that is for doctors. No Jen Rogers, no what matters to you day. She was the person who took it back and said, I could do something with that. No Elaine Wiley, no Daily Mail. You get the kind of And the key thing, I think, is uh, given how daunting the challenges are that Chris outlined at the start and, and how complex I accept some of the solutions are that I've offered you or uh, at least possible solutions, the important thing, I think, is just to start. Uh, uh, and I, I love this uh, poem from a Nigerian-born poet who now lives in the US. And... Uh, I won't read it to you, I'll let you read it. Uh, so thanks for listening patiently for the last 45 minutes. Thanks for inviting me along and uh, it's time for Radical Redesign, isn't it? So thank you so much, Jared. It's, it's Brilliant and a real skill to make complicated things sound so good <coughs> and it's fantastic. We've got a great working relationship with your HI and we have with Derek and it's a privilege to have you here. I'm going to be slightly cheeky and be nice about it twice and just, and we're without 
90 seconds ahead of schedule. I'm not I'm sure we stretched the elastic a bit, so but we might we might call on his good nature and see if there may be two or three questions if people have, if people have got any. So anyone got any questions for Derek? So it's what yeah, one here got. And I think that's part, that's part of the reason why we have to do more what we do and what we do. Because the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's all that we get worse. We know a lot more today. We yeah. have much more growth of the I also think, and so I think it's part of that balance between standardizing what makes sense and customizing to the individual. And then customizing to the individual, that's where the clinician, I think, needs to use their judgment. The other thing I think that you are at least inferring in your question is um, medical training hasn't really changed for, I don't know how long. <laughs> and I think there's, I think we also need to provide a new design there. So can one of, the, one of our other city partners is an organisation called Northwell. And Northwell is the biggest provider of healthcare in New York, New York State. They have completely redesigned medical school. So the first thing you do when you, you go to medical school at Northwell's uh, university is you go out with paramedics. And you see, that you see the real world before you ever look at a textbook. Uh, and I think there's, there are so many opportunities for us just to think differently about how we equip our young physicians to do the work that we need them to do. And I think protocols are important, but they're only one small part of the jigsaw. Let's move on for a little. John, I think we've got a question at the back, and there's a gentleman here who would probably better finish. So yes, just two more. I think uh, to transform it means the ability to think actually. To think actually, we need time and conditions to be available to be able to think actually. Do you think that the present political interventions, which are causing disaster in the practice, which is I believe there is. And I have a, some, I confess that I kind of approach a term gamekeeper position on that because I, uh, in my own world, I was the Director General for Health and Social Care in the Scottish Government, so I was guilty of some of those um, pronouncements um, often ill-considered and not grounded in reality that led to that, those kind of predicaments. Um, and then I discovered quality, which was a way of engaging people in the activity, not imposing stuff on people. Um, I, I, I think there are some, I think there are some real advantages if we can mobilise government activity in service of our professionals and their relationships with patients. I think, it's a, I think it, it, it can be a good thing to have government support. You know, looking at a quill of power across the pond in the United States, the free-for-all in the market is, is it's not really a, I don't prefer it to some government position, but I think government needs to be very careful about the conditions it creates uh, and it, it, it needs to take a step, a step back and let some of the um, some of the ideas flow from the from the interaction between the patient and the clinician, and not from the pen of some bureaucrats sitting in Whitehall somewhere. So, last last question from the gentleman here. Yeah. 
my question is, I mean, the cost of energy has expired now. Uh, is it the multinational companies starting from medicine in terms of life? Or what can we do? Is it the process of that going up? So, I mean, the cost of energy are spiraling all over the world. Well, the cost is, costs cost are increasing everywhere. It's not just an NHS issue. Uh, and I think some of it is because we're, we're falling into the Thomas W. Watson trap. We, we think that the answer to greater demand is supplying more of the same. Uh, and the answer to greater demand is is we design. We need to stop doing some of the stuff that we're currently doing because it has no value. And we need to replace that with stuff that does have value. We need to recognise that um, there are assets in our communities that are just waiting to be recognised and released and somehow we keep them at arm's length and don't engage them in the way that we could. Um, it, I've talked about some of my feelings as a former government official, one of the best investments I've ever made, I spent three million pounds establishing something called the Long-Term Conditions Alliance. It's a group of first sector launching organisations uh, and we just handed over to them uh, some money and said, can you run a grant scheme? That was the only thing. They got 20 times more value from that three million dollars than I would ever have got from spending it in the government or the NHS. Because they knew exactly how to leverage every pound. Uh, and they, they, they did it with proximity to the people who had those long-term conditions rather than our distance. So, uh, yeah, I, look, I think there's, uh, I, I think so long as we, as we, we stick with more of the same as our response, then the cost will spiral. The sooner we start to accept there's some redesign necessary, then we can maybe get a grip on them. Thanks very much indeed, Joe. I think Joe has been incredibly generous with his time and there might be a chance to catch him with some more questions while we have a refreshment after the talk. I think we've always been here for a third time. So, I just, now I just want to hand over to Colonel Nigel Easton, um, who's the master of the Wish of the Callbanger. As we all know, William Martin is a Callbanger and a kind of master. And he can just say a couple of words before we hand out the Callbanger prizes. Uh, Before I go on to the meeting, I'm going to reflect on something I said. The second last is how I say it's working at the back today. Nelson won the Battle of Trafalgar in 1850. They made 1825. I knew all about the battle, so I went into that. A number of factors have been better done around the Frederick. That's the same as they've been. Um, blockading the French, French dispatch fleet in the years and so on. And um, the battle was fought at a high speed of one knot, one knot a mile per hour. Nelson was using ships that were roughly 100 years old in design. And yet we had steam in this country at that point. We could have had steamships on the ocean that day. Nothing to do with it. <laughs> While I'm here, my name is Nigel Mason. I'm the, I have the honour to be the, the, the master, top guy, right? Um, of the working company called Wayne. What's called Wayne? Anybody know? Now, what's called Wayne? Shoemakers. We don't prepare them, we make them. There's a big distinction. We are not coppers. So let's start there. Um, called Wayne, it is all in the back. So for the six winners tonight, we'll get back on the stick here, that's here, um, our great arms. And it shows a ghost for our Starbucks one. Some of the train thought to go there might be moved on, but it's certainly not we achieved. Um, the reason we had that is court rainers came from well, the Moors actually brought very fine weather to Spain in the 14th century. It was picked up by royalty around Europe. It was the highest quality song, but like his letter is now. Um, and it caught on and it's known as court rain. And then by corruption, the name of Cordova is where it started, and then Cordova called that song. Came into the English language and the word was awfully corrupt in about the 11th century and ended up as called Wayne. And we had our, um, our first meeting, I suppose, in like our office, um, on the system of the Lord Mayor in 1275, sorry, 1272. So we are 
747 years old this year. Pretty old organization that might need some radical change as well. Probably. We do all we can. Why am I here? Why are the four ladies have stopped? There are two things. First of all, we are big in education um, and we want to see people succeed. If we can help you guys go on to a better life, remember that. Um, and then do what you do, but we can do something towards it. We will want to hear from you after as well. That's, that's how you did and how you actually got and uh, did it. Um, we will be very pleased that my colleagues here, I'm sure they will be very proud of you. William Martin was indeed a corporate and we heard off about him um, and his uh, passport in sickness and great point of delivery of the He also formed the Royal Martin Hospital for a specific aim in mind. And that was, we know nothing about cancer, it's about time we did, and this will be a cancer hospital, and that's how we got started. And as well as the civil school we're in tonight, the Cordwain's company is actually a follow-up activity this year to raise money for the Royal Martin Hospital. Specifically, something called Paris Giant Pledge with one of our body, um, the um, family, the young son, five years old this year, died of something called um, Ewing Suck. I have no idea what it is, but it's a very nasty, aggressive form of childhood cancer, and that's why I wanted to do this year, so commercial labor. Um, all I hear we need to do is present prize on behalf of your prize office, um, I, I say extremely well done, and you know, we want to carry on to support the education and uh, so on from the man. So the so Gareth then I'm not going to hand out the prizes, but I'll I'll, um, I'll announce them. So the, the first prize we announce is the first prize for overall points in year one, the court waiters prize. That's for Yusuf Suleiman and Giuseppe Sudin. The second prize for tonight is the first prize for overall performance in Logical Way in Year 2, um, which is another core winners prize, which is the Menatala Ava Mohamed Hiku. The third prize um, is the first prize for overall performance in Year 4. What? In Year 3? For the overall performance of year four, the William Marston Scholarship, which is for Afro Lucchese Smith. And uh, the next one is the first prize for overall performance in year five, another called Wayne's Prize, is for Georgie John. And then um, the next prize is the first prize for overall performance in the Wafer at Year 6, uh, which is Dr. K. Jafari. And then the final prize for this evening is the first prize for the best MB PhD thesis. Um, the court winner's prize is Dr. Vishal Roj. Okay, thank, thanks for attending everybody. Um, we run overly large in the overtime, and all I really need to do is just say, say a few thank you. Um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here tonight, we wouldn't have such a, a splendid spread um, if it wasn't for the, the Royal Free Charity, who are fantastic board partners of ours, and uh, we're, I think, at a really exciting time of the charity, coming up to our 200th anniversary, so things are going to um, become even, even, even better, so we're excited about that. I'd also like to thank the uh, cord winners and, uh, and Nigel for their help and their help to our medical students who are our future. You're the people who've got to be really listening to that and take on board exactly what Derek's been saying. And then um, finally, and obviously, I've got, I've got to thank Derek. He's been incredibly generous uh, with his time and, and I think, you know, again, it's, it's <coughs> a great 
you know, as a quite complex story in a very simple and straightforward way. Um, we we go to Rochester to our choice for nearly three years now, and it really has been a fantastic partnership, but I think we've got more to come from that. And whenever he speaks to, to all of us, to Carol and to me, um, he's He's kind of amazingly astute. It's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of shocking sometimes how, how kind of quickly he comes to it. We can't kid him about anything. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Derek, very much. And I know there's more to come on that.